the death penalty to support for a capital gains tax to support for environmental initiatives like a plastic bag ban. And now today, we're going to be talking about gun safety. As a, as a young child, I remember learning about earthquake drills and fire drills. And it wasn't until after Columbine that we added a third type of drill to our repertoire, which was the lockdown. And I distinctly remember the, you know, the change that we had to practice hiding in the classroom. We had to turn off the lights. We had to lock the doors. The teachers had to follow a special new protocol. And it was, it was not traumatic in the sense that we had, any of us had not experienced a mass shooting ourselves, but we could understand that something was fundamentally wrong. The fact that we would have to do this at all was sort of really unsettling to myself and my peers. Flash forward almost 20 years later, and we're well past just the need for lockdowns. We, we need action on gun safety. Now, today, NPI is pleased to stand with elected leaders, with our attorney general, with advocacy leaders, to announce that a majority of Washingtonians strongly support a ban on assault weapons. This is a policy that our attorney general has requested for many years, but it hasn't been adopted yet by the legislature. So today, we can announce that 56% of Washingtonians support an assault weapons ban as of last week's poll, uh, with 52% in strong support, an additional 4% somewhat supportive, and total opposition of 38%, with 7% somewhat opposed and 31% strongly opposed. These are statewide numbers, and they indicate that there is a rock-solid foundation on which to launch this policy in the next legislative session. At NPI, we've been researching gun safety for many years now. We found support for extreme risk protection orders in 2016. We found support for raising the age to buy weapons two years later in 2018. We found support earlier this year for banning high-capacity magazines. And now we're taking the next step at looking at an assault weapons ban. Something that I want to highlight in these findings is that while you just heard the statewide numbers, there's actually support from all regions of the state. In King County, a total of 73% are supportive of an assault weapons ban. 68% of them are strongly supportive. An additional 5% are somewhat supportive. And opposition is 19%. 15% strong, 4% somewhat. You might think that outside of King County, you're not going to find such robust support for this policy, but that's not true. In fact, our poll finds that 50% of voters in eastern and central Washington also support an assault weapons ban. 45% strongly, 5% somewhat. Opposition stands at 43%, 5% somewhat opposed, 38% strongly opposed. So when we look at these numbers and we consider the strength geographically, that's one of the things that jumps out the most to us. This is a policy that people across the state believe we need to have. And we're fortunate today to be joined by a number of leaders who are going to speak to why that policy needs to happen in 2023 and what we can do to get it there. So I'm next going to recognize one of our elected leaders. We'll be going through a number of additional speakers during the course of this press conference. But at this time, uh, it is my great honor to introduce our Attorney General, the Chief Law Enforcement Officer of Washington State, who will react to the poll findings and give you some thoughts on what needs to happen next with respect to this legislation. Attorney General Bob Ferguson. Thank you so much, Andrew, and thanks to you and your team uh, for doing this poll and for all the work that you do on behalf of our community, we, we appreciate it. Uh, I think everyone here who's, who's joining me would agree that uh, I don't think we're shocked by the poll results. Um, it's been my feeling, and I think that's shared by everybody here, that this is one of those issues where the people are way ahead of the politicians, way ahead of the politicians. And you see that from time to time, where politicians, for whatever reason, they delay taking action on issue where the people are already there. And the people are wondering, why the heck aren't you doing something about it? And that's where we are on this issue. The good news is the legislature last year passed that ban on high-capacity magazines. So those high-capacity magazines used by the shooter in Texas, for example, the sale of those are finally banned here in Washington State. However, the AR-15s used by that shooter in Texas are legal here in Washington State, despite the fact that the sale of those weapons are banned in multiple other states. And despite the fact that federal courts across the country have upheld those bans as constitutional. Look, I support the Second Amendment. You can support the Second Amendment and still support common sense gun reform that is constitutional and lawful. 
And that's what this is all about. Other states have done it. Those bans have been upheld. And now it's time for the Washington State Legislature to take that step. Um, look, uh, AR-15s, uh, you know, it's, it's obviously uh, extremely difficult to listen uh, to what happened to the children in Texas. But uh, from reports and interviews and testimony, it's become very clear when AR-15 does to the body of a child. And look, you know, we can't sugarcoat it, right? Literally, the testimony was that some of the children could not be recognized because of the damage inflicted by an AR-15 on their tiny bodies. And that some of those children could only be their identity can only be confirmed by the tennis shoes they were wearing. Look, uh, I understand the fact that we will get exactly zero support from Republican legislators. They are AWOL on the issue of common sense gun reform in this state, and they've got to go to sleep at night with that. So the job is not easy for these wonderful legislative leaders who are here today by any stretch of the imagination. When one party just checks out of a conversation, that does not make it easy. That said, we need to have the political will to take action. This will be, this next session will be the seventh year, I think if I'm counting right, Andrew, the seventh year I proposed a ban on the sale of assault weapons. And you know, we'll go back to it again this year. And it is my hope that legislators, after having successfully passed the ban on the sale of high capacity magazines, are now prepared to take that next step and ban the sale of these assault weapons. It's past time. Um, and uh, I know that the NRA and the gun lobby uh, can make life difficult for politicians who take those positions, but I don't care. They do not intimidate me. They don't intimidate the folks I'm standing here with, and they should not intimidate any single legislator in Olympia from doing the right thing this next legislative session. Thanks so much, Andrew. Appreciate it. Thank you, Attorney General Ferguson. Next, we'll hear from an Alliance for Gun Responsibility board member and mass shooting survivor who will talk about the need for these policies and how effective gun safety laws can be. Emily. It has been two and a half weeks since 19 school children and two teachers were gunned down in their classroom in Uvalde. Every day since, we may have lost an additional 123 more lives to gun violence. That's the average number of deaths a day here in the United States. We live in a country where gun violence does not discriminate, and no one is safe from it. Shootings happen at schools, grocery stores, malls, movie theaters, coffee shops, concert venues, the streets we walk on. On October 1st, 2017, I found myself in the middle of what would become our country's deadliest mass shooting in Las Vegas. In a matter of 10 minutes, a lone gunman used an arsenal of weapons, 12 of which were AR-15s equipped with 100 round magazines to spray more than 1,000 bullets into a concert crowd, shooting more than 500 people, killing 58 of them. We have since lost two more from their injuries, putting the death toll at 60. The chaos that night was unlike anything you can imagine. I've heard war veterans compare it to being on the battlefield with no way to fight back. We were sitting ducks. We ran every time the bullets stopped raining down on us, and when they started back up again, we dove. And somehow, for a reason I will never understand, I made it out that horrific night when so many others standing just inches from me died. It was a sickening game of millimeters. And please hear me when I say you do not need a bullet in your body for you to become a victim of gun violence. I cried when my physical wounds, the scrapes and bruises healed, wondering why I wasn't healing emotionally. I was angry. I was angry that the rest of the world was just moving along as usual while we were left to deal with the aftermath. Mass shootings like Uvalde and Las Vegas dominate the conversation and our perception of the gun violence epidemic. But the truth is, the vast majority of gun violence happens in our homes and our neighborhoods every day without ever making headlines. We never get to learn most of the victims' names or hear their stories. Every day, there are countless other survivors, like me, dealing with the aftermath of their own tragedies. Students who will never see their classmates again. Parents who will never tuck their children into bed. 
People who will never get to be there with their loved ones again, start a career, get married, have a family, all because their life was taken far too soon because our society favors the right to own a gun over the right to live a life free from gun violence. Inevitably, in the aftermath of mass shootings, many are quick to blame mental illness or call for hardening our schools by arming teachers or installing bulletproof glass. Anything to avoid addressing the real problem, which is far too easy access to weapons of war. But we do not have to accept this reality. In fact, Washington voters refuse to accept it. Today's polling shows that, yet again, the people of Washington are ahead of our elected officials when it comes to gun violence prevention. Voters have proven that time and time again, by passing ballot measures to expand background checks, create extreme risk protection orders, and raise the age to purchase semi-automatic assault weapons. Now, Washingtonians are demanding action once again. We are asking for our elected leaders to find the courage to protect people and not gun lobby profits. Congress must take action to reinstate restrictions on assault weapons, like the ones used in Las Vegas, Buffalo, Uvalde. They must expand background checks to all gun sales and pass the other common sense safeguards that the vast majority of Americans agree on. And in the meantime, Washington State must continue leading the way, proving that progress is possible. That means taking action to keep weapons of war off of our streets, establishing tools to hold the gun industry accountable, and investing in community violence intervention work. It means taking comprehensive steps to address gun violence in all its forms. Enough is enough. We cannot afford to keep waiting. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Our next speaker is an elected leader who chairs the Senate Law and Justice Committee and is a very effective leader on gun safety. Please welcome my state senator, Monka Dingra. Good afternoon, everyone. We don't need weapons of war in our schools. We don't need weapons of war in our temples, our malls, our theaters, or our streets. My mother never had to worry that when I went to school that I may not come home. My daughter is graduating high school this weekend, and so many times over all these years when I would drop her off at school, many times I would take a look at her clothing to memorize it, to make sure I knew what she was wearing so that I may be able to identify her. No parent should have to have that thought. No parent should have to worry that when they drop their child off at school, that child may not be coming home. We as a country should have addressed this issue in 1999 when Columbine occurred. The fact that our country has allowed mass shootings to occur over and over again is unconscionable. We in Washington have made tremendous progress in the last five years in curbing gun violence. That progress only occurred because Democrats took the majority in the Senate. It is extremely unfortunate that gun violence, preventing deaths, is a partisan issue. In Washington, we banned high capacity magazines. We prevented domestic violence abusers from getting guns and created the first ever statewide office of firearm safety and gun violence prevention. We still have so much more to do, and eliminating the sale of weapons of war in Washington has to be the next step. And this is again something where the people of the state of Washington have asked lawmakers to lead on over and over again. Gun violence is preventable, we know how to do it, and we now simply must. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator Dingra. Our next speaker is another elected leader from Federal Way who is in the House of Representatives, another fantastic leader on gun safety and so many other issues. Please welcome State Representative Jamila Taylor. Mass shootings are preventable. Our neighbors know this, educators know this, lawmakers know this. We end these tragedies by eliminating the weapons designed to kill people, 
not by arming teachers and parents and kids and school personnel. And shifting the blame of these murders to victims is reprehensible, and it must stop. Here in Washington, voters and the legislature have taken steps to prevent mass shootings. Washington voters approve I-1639 to raise the purchasing age of these deadly weapons and require a waiting period. This year, the legislature, led by Democrats, banned the sale and import of high-capacity magazines. It's when shooters need to stop and reload, lives will be saved in those critical moments. But we must go further. These assault-style weapons belong only in the military, where people receive proper training under strict supervision and used under proper circumstances. We can do more by simply removing these military-style guns from our streets, and we know that the federal ban on these assault weapons worked. There were fewer mass shootings, communities were safer, and there was improved safety for our law enforcement community as well. As summer approaches, thousands of our neighbors will be gathering in community for Juneteenth festivals, Fourth of July celebrations, National Night Out potlucks, live concerts, and back to school events, and so much more. They should be packing snacks and blankets, not Kevlar and body armor. These weapons do not belong in our communities where we have seen the deadly harm inflicted over and over at places of worship, grocery stores, and in our schools. No more excuses. We have long called for bipartisan support on this. We know that the community supports this. We must ban assault weapons. 73% of King County su support the ban on assault weapons, and we must respond to our community's demands for action. Washington must lead the way to implement the policies to reduce gun violence and keep our families and communities safe. It's just common sense. Thank you, Representative. That was wonderful. I'm going to pull uh, the data out here again in case anybody has uh, questions about the research. We have additional cross tabs. I'm now going to open it up for questions. If you would like uh, to ask a question of a specific speaker, please let us know and we'll call that person up to answer your question. Uh, we have a lot of data available in terms of which groups uh, support the ban. So if, if you're curious in a particular demographic, please let us know. And uh, with that, I'll go ahead and open it up to questions. I have a question for the Attorney General. Okay. Thanks for that question. Um, I guess a couple of thoughts, and, uh, and Senator Cooter may, may, may want to add some comments as well. As she's been a real leader on this issue. Um, look, first of all, passing a ban on the sale of assault weapons will be difficult, right? Passing almost any bill in the legislature is difficult, right, by definition. But I think it's fair to say on an issue like this, it's an extra challenge. A couple things I would say is why I feel more optimistic this next session than perhaps in past sessions. So number one, those past six years as well, I'd also proposed a ban on the sale of high capacity magazines supported by the folks here as well. Those are two very big issues, of course. So the fact that one of those has now been adopted by the legislature, that the legislature as a whole stepped up and supported what, what these individuals have been supporting for some time, I think is a positive sign, right? That they took care of that one big issue. So by definition, now we can focus a bit more in terms of our, we all have limited capacity, right, to focus on this next big issue. So I think that that's number one that I think is certainly helpful. Number two, uh, what I would say is that, you know, unfortunately, in a sense, these tragedies that we see over and over again, um, you know, they're a part of the conversation now. And I believe, um, and others may want to share their thoughts, that, um, that when you have a moment like we've had in Texas, that uh, something like that can focus certain legislators who may not have been there before an issue to say, you know what, we can't have that happening in Washington State at a school here. How will I live with myself if I couldn't take a vote, take on the gun lobby to ban the sale of these weapons, if that might happen at my kid's school or some other kid's school here in Washington State? 
So I do think that is a, a part of it as well. And, and then maybe just third, the fact that the legislature did just simply ban high capacity magazines, that was a major step after a lot of years. And I think that sort of bodes well for the possibility of moving forward on banning the sale of assault weapons next session. So look, is it difficult? Yes. Is it made more difficult by the fact that, as I said before, no Republican legislator seems you know, remotely interested uh, in addressing this issue, of course, that makes it more difficult. But, uh, uh, but I do believe that uh, for the reasons I mentioned, and there will be others as well that others may want to speak to, uh, that I think that, uh, that we have a real possibility here to, uh, to get it advanced. And I'd love to hear from Mr. Lamar, but I'll just follow up on the state ban of special weapons as opposed to the federal ban. When we have, I think, a report card that just came out last week that shows I know when it's like the war score for any kind of gun protection, people can just cross state lines and get them. Well, look, there is no... I mean, one thing I've said a lot, when it comes to common sense gun reform or for preventing these kinds of tragedies, there is no perfect solution, right? There is no perfect solution. There's no one thing that any of us can do that's going to solve that problem. That's just not the way it works. It's too complex an issue. Um, but are there things that we can do that will most certainly help? Absolutely. Is banning the sale of high-capacity magazines one of them? Yes. Does that make it much more difficult for someone to acquire one of those? items? Yes. And that'll have the same effect on banning the sale of assault weapons. Will it make it absolutely impossible for someone to acquire one? Of course not. That's not the way it works. But will it make it much more difficult? Yes. Look at the Muckle Teal shooting we had several years ago, right? That young man, 18 years old, I think, if I'm right, I think he was 18 years old, young man, just walked into Cabela's, purchased the weapon, read the instructions outside the home, and did what he did. Um, you can't tell me that if he had to go to another state, to acquire that weapon. Now we wouldn't be legally able to do it, by the way, that that would have made it much more difficult. So those are a few thoughts on it. But again, no perfect solutions. I, I, we understand that. But it's our job as elected officials, on behalf of the people who have made their views clear, to do everything we can to help prevent the next tragedy. Bob, Patty Murray said this morning that there is a change in tone in when it comes to gun control in Washington. And uh, how important is it to have a federal gun law? I mean, she just mentioned, you know, Idaho being close by, Nevada and Arizona, you know, are, are not much better. Yeah, others will want to speak and have their views, but I suspect we're all on the same page that uh, you know, we're obviously focused on the Washington state legislature, but of course, the federal government needs to act. Congress needs to act. Am I wildly optimistic that they're going to ban the self assault weapons? No. So I'm a realist on that. Um, I don't see where 10 Republican votes, but look, that's above my pay grade. I'm not in Congress. But from my standpoint, I guess. I try to focus on what I can control, right, or what I can have an impact on. But you have to live but with that. We have to live with that, sure. So that's why we're talking about doing what we can do here in Washington State. Does that solve the problem? Of course not. But um, well, I don't think any of us are interested in waiting around for Congress to act. We need to do what we can do right now to help save the lives of our children and make our community safer. And should Congress act? Of course they should. Will they? I can't say I'm wildly optimistic, but we have something we can do right here, right now, with our legislature that will help. And you're saying the uh, public is ahead of politicians. Why not take this to an initiative process versus just relying on legislative social? Jane, do you guys want to? I mean, I've, I've got that much. Yeah, I, go for it. I think that's always an option, but we do have a change even in Washington state. Um, legislators. I think there's a willingness, as has been shown in the last five years. We really have made a lot of progress in um, taking a look at gun violence. And not just like um, splashy newsworthy items, but a lot of small steps that are critical. Senator Kudor had a bill that ensured that those who have been found to be a danger to themselves or others lose the right to possess a firearm for six months, making sure that we're addressing suicides by gun violence. I've had multiple bills on ensuring that those who are convicted of domestic violence, specifically domestic violence harassment, lose the right to possess a weapon. We, of course, had the high capacity uh, magazine ban. And uh, this last session, when I became chair of the Law and Justice Committee, the ban on the sale of assault rifles did get a hearing. We heard it in committee. We did not exec it out because we did have other gun legislation that was, uh, we were focused on making sure it crosses the finish line. Next session, this bill will get a hearing, and I am extremely optimistic it'll be passed out of the Senate Law and Justice Committee, and we will see what we do on the floor. Um, I was very proud to um, have the bill that created the first statewide office of firearm violence uh, prevention, 
And again, this is not just about addressing the Second Amendment, but it's taking a look at the data in our state on where gun violence is occurring. Who are the individuals that are involved in gun violence, and how can we do preventative care and uh, intervention in order to prevent further gun violence? So there's a lot that we have been doing in five years, but as our Attorney General Bob Ferguson has said, unfortunately, it is something that the Democrats have to do all by themselves, because there is no support from our colleagues across the aisle on this issue, which is extremely unfortunate. But um, I'm very optimistic that next session, Washington State will step up and be able to pass this bill. Other questions? I do want to speak to uh, Senator Dingra and Representative Taylor mentioned that there aren't really any, you want, I can find any Republicans in the legislature who are supportive of the legislation we need. But that doesn't mean that there are no Republican voters uh, who support this policy. In fact, when we did our poll, we found over a fifth of Republicans, 21%, said they support a ban on assault weapons. 16% strongly and 5% somewhat. So it's not the same number as you know the Democratic voters, which is almost 90%, but it's still almost, that's, that's almost 25%. You know, you're talking about over a fifth. That's not nothing. And I think the number of Republican voters who support an assault weapons ban is likely to grow. I, I see, you know, in our public opinion research, one of the things we look at is trends over time. And we've seen support grow for gun safety laws. Back in 2014, 2016, there was a lot of support for extreme risk protection orders and background checks. Think about where we are today. We've come so far since then. We're now talking about banning assault weapons. And this is after we've banned high capacity magazines and after we pass the legislation that Senator Dingra was just talking about. Sometimes it's the things that don't make the headlines that are truly important. So it's really focusing on all the different solutions. Every bill we pass is another tool in the toolbox. This is another tool that we can use to protect Washingtonians. When you add all those tools together, they protect Washingtonians to a far greater degree than nothing or you know, the absence of federal legislation. We can't wait for Congress, as was said. We have to take action ourselves. We also have to keep urging Congress to act, even though it looks grim, this Congress for action. We still have to urge them to act. We don't just give up. And we also keep pushing for new people to be elected to Congress who support gun safety laws. It always seems impossible until it's done. That's one of my favorite sayings. And it's, it's, you know, it's, it's stuck with me for a long time, and it's so true. We just have to keep at it. That's what it takes, perseverance, dedication, persistence. So uh, any other questions from the press before we wrap up? Anybody? I have an off-the-wall question. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll do you both. Hannah? Oh. Does anyone, uh, specifically Senator Dingra, but any of the state lawmakers or the Attorney General, can you weigh in on the state Supreme Court decision yesterday regarding race and list stops and seizures? Have you had a chance to look at it? It's on my list to read today. Okay, so sorry. It's, just, I'll follow it's up. a very, very, very <laughs> fresh... <laughs> Yeah. Very fresh ruling. Yes. The polling numbers, are, again, are 56% support. Yep. 38% opposed. Uh -huh. uh, 30... 73% support in King County. Yes. And then the other numbers for the other corners of the state? For Eastern and Central Washington, 50% support overall, which is a majority, and 43% opposed. And the strong, somewhat breakdown is 45% strongly supportive. 5% somewhat supportive from Eastern Washington and Central Washington. And then opposed, 38% strongly opposed, 5% somewhat opposed. And I'll also give the poll methodology for those of you who are interested. This poll was conducted by public policy polling in Washington State on June 1st and 2nd, 2022. The sample size is 1,039 likely voters. These are people who are likely to vote in the midterms. Not registered voters, but likely voters, which is a subset. And then uh, we had 50% take the survey using phone, 50% take the survey using text message. So sort of a blended methodology. And the margin of error is plus or minus 3% with a 95% confidence interval. So that's the poll methodology. There is a post up on our blog, the Cascadia Advocate, that has all of these details as well as a visualization. Uh, it's available for anyone's use. If you need uh, broadcast imagery, we can provide that. Just let me know. And we will also have a press release coming as well with the same details. Any other questions? Okay, well, I think we'll, some of us will be available for a little while for pull-asides either here or over there. If you need more material for a broadcast, let us know. 
I will be happy to help you. But thank you all so much for coming. Uh, it was great to have all of you here for this important announcement. I want to thank all of our speakers, Emily, Monica, Jamila, Bob. Thank you, Senator Cooter, who's also here with us from the 48th Legislative District representing NPI's headquarters. Absolutely wonderful to have her here. And thank you to our Deputy Executive Director, uh, Rich Irwin, who helped put all of this together. Uh, we'll see you at our next event. Thank you so much for coming. And let's get a picture with the speakers.